So we're here with the master of guitar, earned by Mr. Uli John Roth. This is the metal voice. And this is Neil Turbin. Thank you, Uli, for letting Hi. me join you on your bus. It's, you put on quite a show tonight. Thank you, sir. You have a fantastic band, and I know because I saw you guys in we Denmark. We certainly have a fantastic band. Yeah, you were there last year. Yes. In Denmark at the festival. Yes, and that was uh, so amazing. I mean, I was. I mean, I was looking forward to your show, and uh, I think I was in my room, and I heard it in a trance, and I was like running to From put the my distance. You, you told I, me I, I had was run, run, awesome. running to put my pants on and get to the show. But you guys are, are phenomenal. It was like surreal, and here we are at the whiskey, and you guys uh, just annihilated the place. Annihilated yes. the place. Yes, I think so. With I hope not. With melody. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good and dynamics. That's a good way of annihilation. And dynamics and finesse and uh, like no one, no one else can do that. So, well, we've, we've had a lot of uh, time to <laughs> develop this. Yes, yes. Craft. So, you know? so Uli, tell me about um, you know your time with the Scorpions. This is the Tokyo Tapes. What do you want to know? So I was very excited when I was uh, buying your record back in New York when I was at the record store and I think it was like probably after it was out. But it was like 19, probably 1980. I think that album was out. What, you were leaving the band. I don't in Tokyo know. Tapes. I, you know, I don't know when it was out. I think it probably came out in '79 or something like that. Yeah. I didn't take any notice at the time because it was almost like a byproduct for me. Because my mind was on the Electric Sun album, you know, and that was much more labor intensive because I had to spend time in the studio. And Tokyo Tapes kind of did itself. We just recorded it. There were a couple of studio sessions afterwards with some of the stuff, but there weren't really any overdubs or something. No. And then I, I didn't even realize when it came out. I have to say, well, you're focused on what you're doing. I was focused. So with the recording of Electric Sun, and I remember that very uh, prominently because you know, I mean, Scorpions is one of my favorite bands, and you know, your presence with the Scorpions and your writing. I mean, I thought the songwriting definitely changed with the Scorpions when you left. I mean, obviously, and I mean, some of those songs, not just some, many, um, all, all of them, but for me, you know, some, some stand out in my mind that I think are just, you know, unforgettable. And it was a slightly different style. I mean, the Scorpions went through quite a few stages of development, and, and I was just at one, I think, important stage, which was like the initial phase, the entire initial phase, and then uh, Rudolf and Klaus really also uh, kept developing as songwriters. They just got better and better, you know. They started writing these big hit songs, and it was also that time of the 80s where everything just went, you know, whoosh. So it was um, just one of these things, you know. Yeah. And I, and I was watching one of your interviews, and I know you actually it wasn't an interview, it was uh, at one of your shows. I think you played in um, one of your tours in the past, you did Redondo Beach. And, um, oh, the bricks. Yes. Yeah. You're, and you're talking about the songwriting and yeah. how. Oh, like in Sky Academy. Yes, yeah, Sky Academy. And you're talking about short, snappy songs, was your little yeah. kind of catchphrase. Yeah. That. Yeah. So, versus those long, epic songs that are. Um, I, yeah, I've never been one for the short ones, you know. I mean, some people are brilliant at that. You know, look at yesterday, Paul McCartney, you know, the Beatles songs, like two and a half minutes, says it all. Fantastic. I, I personally, as much as I enjoy that when it's so well done, but I personally have always been more intrigued by the slightly more, as you say, epic pieces like um, fa fascinated by musical journeys, you know, where you start in one place and you go to a whole development and, and metamorphosis, almost like a good movie, and then you arrive at a different place, which is maybe an unforeseen place, but still um, the kind of place where it should be, you know, and um, yeah, I, I enjoy that. So what are some of the challenges that you see for your band, like where you're improvising on stage and let's say it's a new territory that they haven't, because I, I think you have a phenomenal band and talking with Nicholas uh, after the show, I mean there's some times where you're going up onto the sky guitar into those high frets and I guess they're playing the octave below or something, but is that it's it's kind of different every day, you know. These things are not planned, and nor should they be planned, because uh, there's two different ways of improvising. You can improvise, bye bye, bye bye. There's the painter. He was really good. Um, yeah, you can improvise basically like they do in jazz or in 
certain uh, genres of music on a set a chord structure and then that's a form of improvising but it's like still in a certain framework <clears throat> um, we sometimes do that but my favorite way of improvising is like complete freestyle no holds barred where you really don't know what's happening uh, the next moment and it keeps you on your toes and sometimes you get like the greatest highs in musical highs in a, <clears throat> in, um, a spot like that, a journey like that, you know, um, as long as you know how to do it. It's something one can maybe learn to a degree. I guess you need a certain aptitude also to be very spur of the moment and see the opportunity that, that arises and then almost like a predator go for the next note that is the best choice of all the million um, available choices and that's an instinct that, that uh, can be developed and I've started doing that very very early and I've, I've always enjoyed it you know truly remarkable tonight is, just, is an example of that I think you you know bring that in your I think it happens with every we show had some you do. strange things going on today yeah <laughs> Yeah. Well, I didn't notice, but... No, no, I mean, strange means unforeseen, you know. I don't know, didn't mean it in, uh, as an evaluation, so... You know, but, so, yeah. with, with regards to the Scorpions, um, is there any plans to do um, maybe some any, any other shows with the Scorpions in the future? Not really any, at any the recording? moment. I mean, these things can always happen, you know, and very often when they do happen, they are almost unpremeditated, you know, like <clears throat> uh, a few months ago we were in Japan and we happened to play at the same festival. Um, they played the day before and uh, we played on, uh, I think, the Sunday, which was the day after. And uh, yeah, uh, the promoter just said, why didn't you guys play together, you know, and Klaus and, and Rudolf and Matthias said, okay, let's do that, you know, and then we just played. Awesome. Uh, we'll burn the sky together and it was really nice. It's, it's always good to meet the guys. Um, so you guys are on great I terms. really like, absolutely. I really like them, you know, and we've had so much personal history, uh, stuff like that. It's, you know, it's like a bond that, that doesn't go away. It's, it's just good to, to meet them and, uh, yeah, to hang and doesn't happen that often. I mean, there, there was a time when we did quite a few of these re so-called reunion shows or whatever it was. But then once they started their farewell tour, they, that kind of stopped, you know. And that tour is still going on because it was so successful that in the end everybody thought, oh, well, maybe it's not such a good idea to stop right now. <laughs> well, I mean, to yeah. me, the Scorpions always were, with you, a brilliant band, and they continue to be brilliant band yeah in yeah the, in the different it's almost like two different flavors. bands with um, you know to some degree you know, um, some different flavors different yeah textures so yes forth. yes so are you familiar with I guess there's some rift or, or something between I guess not not so much Rudolf Schenker but Michael Schenker and Rudolf Schenker yeah if I've, I've read the um, meanderings of Michael there it was a little strange I couldn't follow it I don't know what what got into him. You know, I thought Rudolf always did good things for Michael. Uh, certainly, I cannot second any of that stuff. I've been with Rudolf for five years, extremely closely. He's the greatest guy. Uh, I totally respect him on the human level and as a musician. Uh, maybe he's not like a virtuoso guitar player, but he's sure a heck of a songwriter, and that's rare. Now, very few people in rock can actually write a riff like Rock You Like a Hurricane or whatever, stuff that really stays in your mind forever. Uh, Rudolf has that gift and, um, you know, that should not be undervalued and, um, yeah, so I don't know what, what's with Michael. I don't know what, what the problem was. Maybe he knows something I don't know, but I kind of doubt it. And it's it's all about different perspectives. Different people see things in a different light at different parts in their life, you know? Yeah. Sure, I mean some of the stuff he said I could understand where he's coming from. Yeah, okay. Maybe yeah, Rudolf 
place the flying V like is. But then again, that's also natural. They are brothers. Uh, they come from the same kind of background. And um, Rudolf did start the Scorpions. Without Rudolf, there would be nothing Scorpions, you know. Uh, he was the motor from the beginning. He was the only one with the real vision in that band to go forward to do that. And that's uh, a tremendous achievement, you know, um, through thick and thin. And yeah, also the whole thing was a little sad, but maybe maybe it'll all blow over, you know. Uh, I love them both. Uh, I've got uh, the great respect and love for Michael, who uh, was like a complete one-off and one of the greatest guitar players of all time, definitely. Um, so, yeah, but there's no need to, I think there's no need to go up against your brother, you know. Um, thank, you, thank you for those words. Uh, if, uh, if there's a problem, hold your peace, you know, don't do it in public. That's my personal opinion, and I'm only saying it because you asked me. And I don't want to lie to you. It's beautiful. Thank so, you so you know, much. That's my uh, opinion about it. I wanted to ask you about, you know, the Jimi Hendrix uh, influence in your in, in your persona and your playing. And I know that, you know, from the days of uh, Electric Sun and just those days, you know, you, I guess it's it's almost described as not just music but metaphysical. You know, it's 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 almost like a spiritual embodiment, not just the musical component. So I just wondered, you know, from your perspective, how you you know perceive that, and if that's well, you know, um, I've learned uh, so much uh, from that man and through that man. He, he was just uh, um, a very you you said the right word, a very inspirational presence and uh, outstandingly different and. Extraordinary way. I mean, you know, I do happen to to know about musical history going back 400 years, and art history, and history of writing, and um, I'm absolutely certain that Jimi Hendrix was one of the great geniuses of all time, um, and he did everything in four years. Uh, his music was just. Uh, completely original, well as original as it gets, nothing is completely original, of course he came from the blues and soul and did a little bit and stuff like that, but um, in many ways he was more revolutionary and more original than Beethoven or Mozart, who were the greatest geniuses of that time, but they were coming from others and they kind of followed in each other's footsteps a little bit more conservatively. Enrix did stuff like Machine Gun and the Star Spangled Banner and Woodstock, what a statement, you know, um, nobody did that. Uh, to, to me that is like the highest form of art, what he did. Uh, maybe not every single thing, but a whole lot of it, uh, you know, and, and his lyrics, although they were maybe not perfect, but they had a, a very powerful and deep message too. And the whole, um, yeah, the whole uh, package, the uh, artistic uh, package, so to speak, was uh, tremendous. And um, then the, all the other stuff came on top. You know, it was very influential, not just to me, but a whole generation of players, of course. Absolutely. You know, so, so much for your question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I just wondered, um, and you can just say that this is not something that's maybe something you'd want to talk about if it is, but I, I, I just wanted to ask, only because it's been brought up to my attention, so the, the woman who you're married to, who she also drew the, I mean, did the artwork for Electric Sign, is that correct? For the, yeah, I, I was not technically married, oh, but we sorry. were together for a long time. Pardon me. You, you're talking uh, of Monica, Monica Dunham. Right. Yeah, she did... Um, she actually uh, painted all three Electric Sun albums, okay. the, the, the original covers, Earthquake, Firewind, and um, Beyond the Astral Skies. And I feel very um, honored about this because she was a, a great artist uh, with so much talent. Um, and had she lived on, she would have done way more. She was, you know, getting onto a new plateau, uh, so that was um, very, very
very sad that that was cut short. But um, these three electric sound albums, I, I think she uh, she did just beautiful work there. Every single one of them, particularly the third one, Beyond the Astral Skies, is a real masterpiece. Uh, she was so good with painting portraits, way better than most people, because she had the gift of taking a photograph, painting it, and putting actually bringing out the soul of the person. Wow. You know, and sometimes uh, she uh, completely surpassed the quality of the photograph in, in the way that it became almost, almost more lifelike. And she, uh, she specialized in portraits and she did like uh, a whole series of uh, um, amazing um, Jimi Hendrix portraits and which are reflected in her book, The uh, Inner Life of Jimi Hendrix, you know. And um, she was the only one in that circle of Hendrix who really um, brought forward an attention, put, uh, attention on Jimmy's message, which for him was actually the, the most important thing, you know. It wasn't his guitar antics, you know, that, that's what started the journey, but um, that's what he wanted, you know, and um, he asked her to, to basically do the artwork for him because he immediately recognized her talent. And so I was uh, very um, lucky that um, she then, you know, carried on in that in that vein that she did my artwork. Yeah. So she she also was, I guess, with Hendrix at the time of his death or something. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yes. Yes. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, he died in the hospital, you know. And so that's a long story. We've heard millions of different versions. Um, I've known her so well, and there has been controversy. Um, in, in my mind, there was never a doubt, a shred of a doubt, that she alone uh, knew what was going on, and she always uh, told me the truth with that. It was just some really tragic, almost accident, you know. He was just careless. He was so um, careless um, with things like that, you know. Uh, I guess too much of an artist, and in some ways maybe not grown up enough, you know, as you are when you're 27, you know. Um, it was his own doing. Uh, he, he had these pills, he couldn't sleep, he thought, oh, these don't work, you know, and he just popped too many, and uh, then in the end he couldn't breathe, you know, and uh, they worked on him for an hour in the hospital, but it was too late, and they resuscitated him a couple of times, you know, but it was just a, a whole tragic story, you know, but self-inflicted, I'm sorry, that's, um, she didn't say that, but I say that, because that's what I gathered from the entire circumstance, you know, and yes, maybe, you know, I mean, had he been in a different ambulance with more skilled people around, maybe that wouldn't have happened, in fact, probably wouldn't have happened, you know, but back then, the ambulance people were not trained in England. Unbelievably so. They didn't really have any training. You know, they just bought, were almost drivers only. You know, so. I think it was just a chain of um, unfortunate uh, circumstances. Had he lived, I think he wouldn't have, would have taken a sabbatical of a year off. He was a little burnt out towards the end. He needed a break. He wanted to have a break for a year learn how to write and read music, write for orchestras or larger sections, you know, and he would have come back with something very, very powerful, no doubt, you know. You're really an inspiration to all of us because we all want to get better and to get as good as you are. We I mean, all need lot, to get better, that's, that's the whole deal, and, and I've done that all my life. Uh, I always think uh, there's room for improvement, and that's very important, and, you know, um, if that's transmitted, that's the right way, and I think you're onto something. That's exactly the way uh, ahead. And um, if all of mankind thought like that, we, we wouldn't really have any problems. You know, a, a lot of people are just too set in their ways, and they don't want to get better. And then they stay static. That means uh, everything goes down the drain because they're just too complacent with the status quo. Thank you, guys. This is the Metal Voice. This is Uli John Roth. Rocking the whiskey with his hard rock right here in Hollywood, California. Thank you, Uli. It's a hey, pleasure. Thanks. An honor for me. Thank you.